of Acts this morning, Acts chapter number 9. As we open up the scriptures, our prayer is that we will walk through this together and be able to see what does God say, because if I give you what is the words of Tommy Hensley, they will surely fail. But I'm glad that we come under the word of God that we might be able to see what God says. And so let's walk through this together. How many has ever worked with or tried to train or teach someone that knew everything? Anybody know what I'm talking about? And man, you're trying to help them, right? You're trying to teach them. You're trying to show them what you, you've been learning over the last 10, 15, 20 years. And oh, oh, no, they know how to do that, right? We've all been there, and that is a very dangerous place to be. You say, Pastor, I'd have never met somebody like that. Well, that might be because you're the person, okay? <laughs> that might be because you're guilty. Um, questions are a very powerful tool, very powerful tool. Someone once said, what makes a man is not the answers that he gives, but the questions that he asks. All of us have been shaped by questions uh, that we have asked. All of us have been shaped by questions that we have failed to ask. And we have become people based upon those responses and it has transformed us because of those questions. And not only is a question very beneficial and that you should be a people of questions, but also who you ask is very, very important. I heard a story about a man who had went to a revival service every night of revival. On the last night, the pastor got up and preached a very powerful message. And at the end of the message, the pastor said, I want everyone who needs prayer to come forward and we're going to find somebody to pray with you. The man was a bigger, burlier kind of guy and he gets up, he's about halfway through the pack and he locks eyes with the evangelist that was preaching. The evangelist thought to himself, I'm going to pray with that person. So he was giving these people out at the altar to help somebody help pray with them. And he said to himself, the evangelist said, I'm going to pray with that man. So he gets up to where the evangelist is at and he said, the evangelist says, what is it that I can help pray with you about, sir? And the man says, I want you to help and pray about my hearing. And so the preacher began to pray. He immediately grabbed him by the ears and began to pray for the man's hearing. And uh, he was very powerful in his prayer. He was waxing elegant and he was very, very loud because he wanted to be able to have the man hear him in this uh, disability. And so he was praying loud. And at the end of his prayer, he said, amen. And he looked at the man square in the eyes. And he said to him, sir, how's your hearing now? And he said, oh, it's not until next Wednesday. Okay. So who you ask is a very critical point on if you receive help or not. Okay. Um, and in our text this morning, we have came to a man who has some very pressing questions. His name is Saul. You will know him as the apostle Paul. One that you can relate to and you hear himself, yourself in his writings. Uh, one that you, you love, but this was before all of that happened. Acts chapter number 9, his name actually isn't Paul and he's not an apostle. At this time his name is Saul and he is a persecutor of the church. Everything that would be happening here at this point in his life he was trying to get rid of that and purge the world of Christianity. And he was doing a really good job. How many ever heard of a man named Stephen? Anybody understand the first uh, uh, deacon who was a great preacher? And he got up and the stoning of Stephen, that was under the authority of this man named Saul. And no doubt that young man, Stephen's, in his words, burned deep into the mind and the heart of Saul. No doubt it affected him. But in his sin, he is plunging deeper and further away from God. But something happens in Acts chapter number 9 as he is going to Damascus to get more authority to persecute the church and all of those that are there. Something happens as an impasse in his life. And he has got to respond to it because of what is happening around him and on the inside of him. I'm so happy that there are times in our life when something happens to us that is deep, that is spiritual, that we know I can't pass this opportunity. I need to seek what's going on. And that's where Saul is at. And what happens is, is what this experience we're about to read makes his heart ponder two questions. 
Saul will ask two questions to the greatest source of wisdom as he is asking God himself. So Saul's two questions to God, I believe, are the greatest questions that man has ever had to ponder. And I believe every person in the sanctuary tonight should have one of these two questions burning deep within your heart. I believe these two questions are everything that we need to ponder and ask ourselves today. And really, not even ourselves, but God Himself. So I want us to look at the Scripture, and I want you to see if you can find these two questions as we begin our reading in Acts chapter number 9. Look at verse number 1. The Bible says, "...and Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest." Now, I want you to understand that the Bible is, an ex is not an exaggeration book. And verse number 1 could not be more underread than what is being read here. Uh, Saul is breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord. He went into the high priest and desired to him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, and that he found any of this way, of the Christian way, of followers of Christ, whether they be, were men or women, there was no respecter of persons. He did not like any man or woman. He might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. <laughs> and he fell to the earth, heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Now that's the first question, but it's not Paul's question. It's not Saul's question. That's the Lord's question. Now notice with me, if you would, in verse number uh, five. And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. With the help of the Lord this morning, I want to preach on this subject. I've got some questions. I've got some questions. I believe every one of us have questions burning in our heart. Some questions are horizontal. And some questions are vertical. But I believe if we could boil all the great questions down, it would be these two basic questions that Paul asked the Lord that day. And so I want us to look at this truth. I've got some questions. Let's pray and ask God's blessings on the service. Lord, it is a blessing and an honor to be in your house with your people. God, I'm thankful for all of those that have come this way today, Lord, providentially, I believe, because we need to hear a word from you. God, we, we want to be able to come into a house where there is love, where there is a spirit of unity and family and peace. God, but we also want to feel the truth of God as it's presented to us. So Lord, I believe that most of us have come into a warm environment and greeted with fam, 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 uh, family and friends. And, but Lord, I pray that as the Word of God would be presented, that truth would fall upon our hearts and our lives, and God, may our lives be changed. Lord, I believe that if you came at this very moment, there would be one person go, and then the next person would be left because they're not prepared for eternity. So Lord, I pray that you would help us answer, see these questions, and then in application, apply them to our heart and to our life, God, today. For it's in the name of Jesus that we pray, amen. I believe these are the two greatest questions that man could ever ask and the greatest source to ever ask them would be God himself, the word of God where we find the authority of our life and our faith and our practice. And so when we come to this portion of scripture, the, the second question that Paul will ask is found in verse number six. Would you notice what he says in verse number six? Here's the question. And he trembled, astonished, said, Lord, what will thou have me to do? Isn't that a wonderful question? What an amazing question that is. Lord, what is it that you want from my life? God, what is the purpose of my existence? God, what is your will, your purpose, your desire to see me do, accomplish as you give me breath and the ability to operate through this life? What is it, God, that you want from me? I believe every true born-again believer in your heart and in your soul wants to know, God, what is your purpose for my life? God, what is it that you have specifically 
for me? I think that's a wonderful question. I believe if you're here today and you're saved, I believe that's the question that you should desire to know, God, what is your purpose? Because I don't want to live all of my days, look back at the end and think to myself, what have I done for Jesus Christ? I want to be able to live every day knowing that I, as I pillow my head at night that I've accomplished something for the glory of God. Because one of these days, this earth is going to melt with fervent heat. It's going to pass away. And we're going to be living in eternity if you're saved with the Lord Jesus Christ. And we want to be able to give something to the glory and praise of God. So, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Tonight, we're going to be looking at that question. In the service at 6 p.m., we're going to be dividing that, that we might find some guidance on the subject of how should we discover the will specifically of God for my life. But today, we cannot pass by the first question that Paul had. It's the pressing question that was burning deep within his heart. And it's found in verse number 5. The Bible says, And he said, Who art thou, Lord? He saw all these things that transpired. He was feeling something deep within him. And he had a question, Lord, who are you? God in heaven, what is your name? Who is it that is over all these things? Paul, I believe, was looking at his life and thinking to himself, man, I've served a lot of things, but what's happening in me right now is something that I cannot comprehend and understand. Lord, I need to know who you are. Lord, who are you? And so uh, before we answer this question this morning, I feel that there are some things around it that we first need to realize and notice in our text. The first thing I notice here in verse number one is that everyone has a Lord. Everyone has a Lord. Everyone is serving something. The Bible tells us here in verse number one, and Saul yet breathing out threatenings and slaughters against the disciples of the Lord went unto the high priest. Saul was living life pulled to and fro at the whims of this religious circle that he was living in. He had submitted himself to the high priest and he was living at the desires of this man, a a lord of his life, and he was servant to uh, who he was uh, following here. And now he is looking for power and prestige among men. He wants to rise up in the circles of the accolades of the Sanhedrin. He wants to be a part of this a great body of uh, religious entity that was there in Jerusalem. He was looking for that, and because that, he was, uh, that was the Lord over him, and he was subject to him. Simply put, a Lord is something that calls the shots in your life. Yeah. May I ask you a question? Who is the Lord of your life? How, how are you making daily decisions? And what is it that you're seeking direction from? How, what is it that calls the shots in your life? What is it that drives you? We all have something like that. For some, I believe the Lord of their life is material things. There's a lot of people who are living just to get something else. You're working trying to afford the next thing and to get the next prize and to get the next uh, possession. Uh, You want the bigger house and that's what's driving you and that's what is making you do the things for which you do on a daily basis. You want the best car and you want the nicest toys and you want to upgrade this section of your life. And what you're doing is you're living for things that never ever matter. A Lord to you is material possessions. Others are living for a career. All you feel like is I've got to continue to climb. And all I do is I'm just living to make sure I get to the next level, the next level, the next level. We've all heard of success stories where someone started as, you know, the, the, the janitorial work. And then in that company, they moved up to the front office. And then from there, they moved up to the vice presidency and then the CFO and the CEO. Let me tell you, if you go to that person right now, they would be wondering, what's next? What's next? Uh, One of the things that has always been deep within me, and I think every one of us should be paying attention to, is, is when Tom Brady won his last Super Bowl. And man, the best in the sport. You cannot mention NFL without thinking about Tom Brady. But he gets to this last tremendous victory, uh, achieving accomplishments that no one else has ever achieved before. The greatest of all time in his sport. 
and he has nothing now to really live for. He looks back and says, what has it gained to me? I'm going to tell you, that should tell every person who's in sports something. That it's not what it's all cracked up to be. Because at the end of the day, if your Lord is a little L God, then it can never please. It can never bring lasting joy. It can never bring lasting peace. And something to really honestly live for in your heart. Some people are living for physical appearance. And everything in your life is trying to make you look good. And man, you've tried everything. You spent money in this and that and the other, and all you care about is how people perceive you. Man, I want to tell you, there's a lot of people that that's the Lord of their life. There's a lot of people who have the Lord of pleasures. And everything in your mind goes to how can I, how can I have this lustful thought? And you're steered and you make decisions and you do things that most people wouldn't do simply trying to find some pleasure. Others have the, the Lord of comfort. The list goes on and on, but really it doesn't matter what Saul's was. If we say the high priest or power and prestige, it really doesn't matter what Saul's was. You know what matters? Is who is yours? Who is yours? Who are you living for? What are you living for? Because the Lord is not only a question of who, it's a question of what. What is it that drives you? And let me say, if it's anything besides Jesus, you're going to look back one day and regret everything that you've done. Because it just doesn't have lasting purpose. Jesus will help you live for something that matters. For him and others, I love the the acronym of joy, Jesus first, others second, and ourselves somewhere after those things. That is thing called joy. So everyone has a Lord. And then I want you to notice also in our text that he was shown a great light. So he had a Lord, but then he saw a light. Look at verse number, uh, verse number three. And he journeyed, and as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. Somebody say amen from a light from heaven. Something got his attention. Uh, How many has uh, ever been pulled over? Anybody ever been pulled over? Let me me see it real high. This is, you know, honesty here. Okay, very good. I could go through the list of things and reasons why you have been pulled over. Uh, How many has been pulled over this week? Now the truth really comes out, right? On Thursday, we had uh, Miss Sandy uh, 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 Pfeiffer, who uh, had surgery in uh, Carmel area. It was at 530. I got up and went, was able to be with her and had a great time with her. We prayed, um, met with the family, spoke with them for some time. And then I left. I was going to Miss Martha's house. Miss Martha, you did not know this, but I got pulled over before I got to your house. And um, I was coming through New Palestine, and uh, they're doing construction in New Palestine. How many knows that there's construction in New Palestine, right? Okay. There's construction in New Palestine, if you didn't know that. And I think the speed limit has changed. Um, I think I was going 35. I think it might be 10. I'm not 100% sure. (laughs) But my mind wasn't there, because usually when I drive, for however God gets me there safely, I just arrive, and I'm like, oh, I'm here. Because my mind's not on what I'm doing. And, um, but I, I was lost in my thoughts and I was, you know, singing something loud on the stereo and I was driving my car and guess what? I saw a great light. <laughs> Red and blue in the rear view, right? And the first thing I thought to myself was, I bet I can outrun him and get away from this. <laughs> no, it's not. Okay, I, we got a lot of police officers here. <laughs> that was not my first thought. <laughs> My first thought, which I, you need to have this, is how quick can I get over and talk with this person, okay? And uh, talk to this officer, and we're thankful for what they do. So I pulled over, and uh, I rolled down my window, and I'm starting to talk to myself, right? <laughs> do you talk to yourself? Like, no, 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 And then you imagine what he says, and then you, you know. <laughs> and so he came up to the window, and I said, hi! <laughs> okay. Because I speak louder and higher pitch when I'm nervous and um, so I'm not nervous right now so I'm gonna <laughs> so I was I was talking with him and he says uh, this this car is uh, uh, 
owner of uh, owner of, of this car is Bethel Baptist Church. And I said, yeah. I said, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. He said, what do you do? I said, I'm the janitor. Um, <laughs> janitor. No. He says, yeah. I said, yes, sir, it is. And he says, what do you do there? I said, I, I'm, I'm the pastor. <laughs> yeah. And he said, oh, you're the pastor. He says, I pulled over lawyers and I pulled over doctors and nurses, and, but I've never pulled over a preacher. And I said, congratulations. <laughs> oh, man, congratulations. And uh, he was very kind, very courteous. Uh, and he, he simply told me, he said, sir, you probably got a lot of things on your mind, uh, but I'm going to ask you as we're going through this section of, of uh, New Pal, uh, make sure that you obey the speed limit because we got a lot of people working. I totally understood it. I was ready to pay a fine if need be because I understood that the laws and I had transgressed those laws. But do you realize that there is a great light that shines from heaven that also tells us that we have transgressed the laws of God? You're not the only one guilty. I'm guilty. Person beside you is guilty. And praise God that in our guilt and in our shame, there is a faithful one who comes to us to show us the light of God. The Bible tells us in John chapter number one, verse number nine, that Jesus is the light of God, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. The light of God that shines to show us our darkness, to show us and to reveal our transgressions. And the sad thing about it is many have thought to themselves when they see the light, when they finally experience a, a, a moving of the Holy Ghost of God, they don't quite understand it. They're a little nervous and they hold the seat in front of them and they say, I can outrun him. I can get away from this. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you, you're going to live a miserable life. How many of the first time you realized that you were a sinner and the light came on, you tried to outrun the Lord? Anybody ever, how many has ever been there, right? That's a miserable, miserable life. You know what you need to do? Pull on over and say, yes, sir. Who art thou, Lord? We find here that there is, we notice that everyone has a Lord. We notice that every, uh, we see everyone has a great light. Jesus is the light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. And then I want you to notice that he heard a voice. He heard a voice. Do you remember in the Bible, the Old Testament, there was a man named Eli? Eli had a job. Anybody remember the job of Eli? What was his position? Anybody remember? He was the high priest. Yes, the high priest. Uh, and, and he had the uh, temple that was there at Shiloh. And we understand his boys were scoundrels. And uh, they were, um, you know, being a disgrace to the sacrifices of the Lord. But there was a young man that was put under his care. And that man's name was Samuel. One night, Samuel's laying upon his bed there in uh, the uh, temple, uh, in the housing section of the temple of God. And he hears somebody yell his name. Maybe he said it. Maybe it was a still small voice, but he heard his name. Samuel, Samuel. You remember what he did? He got up and went to Eli and said, Master, you've called for me. And he says, no, 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 I haven't called for you. Go back and go to bed. And so he did. Second time, he felt that calling. And same thing happens. Third time, he gets back up, goes to Eli and says, I've heard you now the third time. What is it that you want? Eli perceived that it wasn't the voice of a man, right? It was a voice of the man. <laughs> the Lord Jesus. And he says, when you get back to your bed, when you hear it again, maybe I should say this, when you feel it again, here's what you need to say. Yes, Lord, thy servant heareth. Amen. And that's what happens. There's many people who have sat in the sanctuary You've seen the light, God, it comes on, you know. I, I realize I'm a, I'm, I'm a sinner. And then you feel the Holy Spirit of God say something loudly to your heart that your ear can't comprehend, but it's so much more audible than what's audible. And you know God is dealing with your heart because it's the light of God that shows us our sin. It's the Holy Ghost of God that shows us that there is one who is calling you. 
to salvation. And here's what happens when Saul, living a life unto a Lord, a little L Lord, sees the light of God and hears the voice of God. Here's what happens. Are you ready? Look at verse number 4. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? I want us to understand what happens when he asks this question, Who art thou, Lord? Who is this Lord? Who is this God? Who is this omnipotent creator God? Who is it? Well, I want us to notice first that it's the one who has long known you. This Lord that Saul was speaking to at this time, who art thou, Lord, was the one who had always known him. Notice with me, if you would, in verse number four. And he fell to the earth and said it with a, a voice, heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, do you realize that God didn't have to nudge one of the angels beside him and say, hey, what's that boy's name down there? Do you realize that? Do you realize that he didn't have to uh, go to uh, someone's house and inquire of this man named Saul? No, listen, he had known Saul before Saul was ever even physically born. He had seen him. He knew him. He knew the time when his mother pronounced his name for the first time. His name shall be called Saul. He knew this man. Not only did he know his name, Saul, Saul, but he knew his deeds. Look at verse number uh, four again. Saul, Saul, now notice the deeds. Why persecutest thou me? So not only did he know his name, he knew what he had done. He knew what he had thought. He knew what he had experienced. He knew everything about Saul. And may I say, there is a God still in heaven, and His name is the Lord Jesus Christ. And not only does He know your name, He knows everything about you. He knows everything that you've ever said. He knows everything that you've ever done. He knows everything that you ever even thought about. And you say, Pastor, I'm in trouble. If God knows everything about me, I'm in trouble. You know what the answer is? Yes, you are. You want to know why? Because here's the truth. All of us have sinned and fell short of the glory of God. All of us have. And you know what the wages of that sin is? Death. Romans 6.23, we all know it, right? For the wages of sin is death. We've all earned wages. We go and we work and we work and we work so that we can get what we deserve at the end of the week. We, we, have, we all know what a wage is. It's, it's what we get because of what we've done. And here's what God teaches us in Romans 6.23. The wages, what we, what we get because of what we've deserved, the wages of our sin is death. And this word death is, the best way to describe this word is Separation. How many has ever had someone near, dear, that you love with all your heart die? Anybody ever been there? And you go up to the front and there's a, a casket there or an, an urn. And you go up to it and you see their body, right? But you know they're not there, right? It's the shell of a, of a person. But who made them who they are? who made them the person you love, the soul, the spirit of who they are, you understand that <laughs> they're not there anymore. So death is separation. Physical death is separation from body and soul, body and spirit. That is the definition of death. It is uh, leaving the body. It's physical death. But in that text in Romans, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, Romans chapter number six, verse number 23, the wages of sin is death. It's not talking about a physical death. It's talking about a spiritual death. And let me say, what the Bible tells us that we deserve because we've all sinned is separation. And it's not separation from a physical body. It's separation from God Almighty. And that's why hell is everything that heaven is not. Somebody give me an attribute, a quality of heaven. Somebody help me preach this morning. Tell me something about heaven. No sickness. 
I'm going to tell you, hell is a place where the, the sorrows and the sores never pass away. Somebody else, tell me about heaven. Peace. Oh, my goodness. Have you ever felt peace that passes understanding? Can you imagine living in that always? That's heaven. Hell is a place where there is no peace. The Bible says that there's cries continually. I heard somebody else say something over here. Tears? No tears. No tears. No, ain't that a sweet thing? I love that the Bible tells us that he shall wipe away every tear. You know what the Bible says? That hell is a place where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Heaven is a place of, of light. There's never a night in heaven. Now, I don't know what that's going to feel like. You know, how many like sleep? Anybody like sleep? <laughs> It's like, oh, I want to talk about this one. <laughs> but there's no darkness. But you're living in a glorified body. You don't have to have that because there's an eternal rest that is within. And yet hell is a place of outer darkness. You know why hell is everything that heaven isn't? Because heaven contains God. And hell is separation from God. Therefore, everyone who dies in their sin goes to a place called hell. For the wages of sin is separation from God. But that verse doesn't end there. If you know anything about Romans chapter number 6, verse number 23, it's a beautiful verse. But it's a beautiful verse because it has a conjunction. <laughs> How luck, like, like that conjunction. It says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You know what Paul said? He says, I, he, I saw the light, I heard a voice, and here's what I said. Who art thou, Lord? Yeah. Who, who art thou, Lord? Because he has acknowledged who this person is. Saul, Saul. Saul, Saul. And we see here in the text that God knew everything about him. Not only his name, but also his deeds. His deeds. The Bible tells us in 1 John chapter number 2, verse number 9, that He, Jesus, is the propitiation for our sins. But not for our sins only, but the sins of the whole world. Jesus died to pay the debt of all man's sins. That whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Listen, He's a God that knows everything about you. We have a little boy, his name's Nathaniel. This is his middle name. His first name is Tommy. We named him Tommy to continue that heritage. He's the number, number four. Number four. And we picked Nathaniel, and that's what we, most of us go by. Several of us, well, front row over here, calls him Tommy, little baby Tommy. But uh, he called Nathaniel because he came to us unexpectedly in an unexpected time. December the 20th. And Nathaniel means gift of God. We had... Um, Read that in John chapter number one about Nathaniel. And anybody remember the story of Nathaniel? He doubted God. He, he doubted Jesus. He doubted that Jesus was the Messiah. I mean, Jesus had come and he had begun to call his 12 disciples unto him. And he calls a man named Philip. And Philip, man, is a great evangelist. And he goes to this, this young man named Nathaniel, who is no doubt maybe a relative, at least a close friend. And he comes to Nathaniel and he says to him, I want you to come and meet a man who can tell you everything about it. And he says, uh, uh, Nathaniel responds, uh, what good thing could come out of Nazareth? What good thing could come out of Nazareth? And so Nathaniel comes to Jesus with skepticism. How many ever came to Jesus with skepticism? Yeah. Whoop. And he comes to Jesus with skepticism and he asks the question, how do you know me? You know what Jesus says? Before that Philip called thee, when you were underneath that fig tree, I saw you. You know what he knew about Nathaniel? Everything. You remember the woman at the well? She says, how do you know me, Lord? Well, thou hast had five husbands, and the man that you're living with now is not even your husband. He knew her. She bows before him, just like Nathaniel does, claims him to be her personal savior. She runs into the city over against him and she says, come see a man who's told me everything that I've ever done. Listen, here's the amazing thing about God. Are you ready? Listen, he knows everything that you've ever done, everything that you've ever said, and everything that you've ever thought. Let me ask you a question. How many would be comfortable with me coming up here today and saying, 
okay, we're going to reveal everything that this person has ever said, ever done, and ever thought. How many thinks the person beside you would probably not have as much respect for you as they did right now if they knew everything? How many, how many would agree to that? Here's the amazing thing about God. Are you ready? Saul, Saul, I know you. But number two, he's not only the person who knows everything about you. Number two, he's the one who has long loved you. You know what? Jesus knows everything. But you know what? In his mercy and in his grace, he loves you. For God so loved the world. I want you to notice verse number six. I'm sorry, verse number five. And he said, who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I love how Jesus answers. Are you ready? I am Jesus. I'm Jesus. Doesn't, isn't that a great answer? Yeah. I'm Jesus. God, who are you? Here you go. I'm Jesus. Now, how many loves the, the vast barrage of names that Jesus is? Anybody, it's like, I can't speak English, but I know the name Jesus, right? Yeah. How many knows another great name of Jesus? Anybody got one? Somebody help me. What is it, Terry? Oh, okay. Yeah, give me a name of Jesus, of the Lord. Oh, I comforter. comforter. I am the comforter. He could have named that. Because he, he is that God of all comforts, the Bible says. How many guts, guts one? Yes, Don. Savior. savior. I am the Savior. Who, who, somebody else, help me out. Donna. I am the counselor. Somebody else, help me. I am the morning star. I am the great physician. I am the Prince of Peace. I am that I am. But you know how he answers him? Are you ready? I am Jesus. So, Pastor, what does that say? That tells this man, this, this religious but lost man, who had been living in this religious facade of being right with God, that hated Jesus. You want to know why they hated Jesus? Because he ate with who? Publicans and sinners. They hated him. You want to know why? They hated Jesus because Jesus loved people. Yeah. Oh, man. Jesus, remember Simon, the Pharisee, has Jesus over at his house and they're having a meal together and a woman comes in, breaks her alabaster box, uh, pours her tears upon him, wipes her, uh, his feet with her hairs. And Simon said, if, she, if he knew the woman that that person was, he wouldn't let her do it. Oh, Jesus knew everything about her. Yeah. But he loved her. And they hated it. Why? Because Jesus is love. Jesus is love. He was filled with truth and grace. And they did not like him because he was operated in love. Jesus says, if you love one another, all men shall know you are my disciples because you have love for one another. And when he responds with this word, I am Jesus, Saul not only knew that this God knew him, but he could put himself now in the same position as that woman with her alabaster box, he knew now that not only does that person know him, he knew that that God loved him. And God extends to this man grace and by faith, he receives Jesus Christ to be his personal savior. If you've ever done that, would you say amen? amen. If you've ever done that and you just said amen, here's your next question. Are you ready? What wilt thou have me to do, Lord? Yes, That's our tonight focus. This morning the focus is this. Who art thou, Lord? Amen. Who art thou, Lord? Because there's someone here today who doesn't know Jesus as their personal Savior. And the Holy Spirit of God right now has shined the light. He's extended the voice. And now he wants to know. Who, as he's extending grace, will simply say, by faith, I'm going to take him to be my personal Savior. Amen. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Let's all stand together. John chapter number 3, we all know 316. But what brought 316 to reality was Nicodemus. 
Nicodemus had questions. He said, how can a man be born again? How can a man be born when he is old? And here's what Jesus says. He says, the Spirit bloweth where it listeth. Just like the wind. We have never seen the wind. Did you realize that? All we can see is the effects of the wind. I've never seen the Spirit of God. I've never seen the Lord Jesus Christ. But I'm going to tell you, I have felt the effects. Amen. And Jesus says that as the Spirit of God is moving, you'll feel it. And if you're here today and you've never trusted Jesus Christ to be your personal Savior, guess what? Right now, you probably realize that as the Spirit of God is moving. And God is saying, you need to receive me as your personal Savior to receive forgiveness of sins, relationship with God and a home in heaven. Let me ask you a question this morning. If you have trusted in Jesus Christ and Him alone by faith, and you've received Him to be your personal Savior, by testimony of that, nobody looking around, would you just raise your hand and say, Pastor, that's me. I have peace in God. I praise the Lord. Man, isn't that sweet? Oh, I love it. I want you to take some time right now and I want you to thank him for that. You're unworthy. You have lived a life filled with shame and regret and sin. You've said things that you never should have said. You've done things that you never should have done. But even though he knew that, he loved you anyways, extended his grace to you. And I praise God today that you've received Christ as your personal Savior by faith. I want you to thank him. But if you're here and you've never accepted Christ as your Savior and you feel that, you, you, you by the Holy Spirit of God know right now and understand, hey, I'm lost. I'm, I'm away from God. Let me ask you a question. If you want to receive Christ as your personal Savior and God has spoken to your heart right now, here's what I want to ask you. Would you just raise your hand right now? Nothing, nobody looking, just me and you. And if you want to receive Christ as your personal Savior, I love, love the opportunity to share with you how you can know for sure that you're heaven bound, forgiven of sins, and can have a relationship with God. Is there anybody here today that would say, Pastor, that's me. I want to know that. I want to know that. Anybody here that just says, Pastor, I feel this moving in my heart and I want to know that for sure. Anybody? Anybody? As Miss Tia begins to play on the piano, I want you to take some time this morning <clears throat> and just say, God, I'm so unworthy. But I'm so glad that you revealed yourself to me. God, I don't deserve it. I couldn't ever earn it. But God, I'm thankful that you introduced yourself. God, you, you hung on the cross in shame for me. You were beaten and mocked and scoffed for me. God, you walked up Calvary Seal and gave your life a ransom for me. Who art thou, Lord? He says, I am Jesus. If you've received Christ as your personal Savior, your next question should be the same as Saul's. Lord, tell me what you want me to do. God, you show me your will and I'll do it. You show me your will. If you don't know him as your savior, you need to find, it, find him today. You need to come today. Receive him. Hear my Lord. Hear my Lord. Lord, we love you and God, we're so thankful for this time to Simply walk through your word and see what you have for us. God, we have come with a desire to hear from you, and I believe with all of my heart we've heard. God, there is no doubt someone in this service today that is away from you. It's never been saved. God, I pray that you'd help them not to walk out these doors without receiving you to be their personal Savior by faith. Lord, there's also some people here today that have known you. You're their Savior. 
Lord, you've never repented of the time that you saved them from their sin. God, you, you haven't thrown them out. But God, they are living a very guilty distance from you. So God, I pray that you'd help them, Lord, to repent of where they're at and what they've done. And Lord, restore the joy of their salvation today. God, may they say like Saul, Here am I, Lord. Send me. Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? God, that one that's here and wondering and questioning in their heart, God, what is your purpose for my life? God, I want to do something for you. God, I pray that you would help them to just simply in a study of God's word, find, God, what is God's will? God, I pray that you'd help them return tonight at 6 p.m. We'll look through the guidelines, the biblical guidelines of how to know the will of God for our lives. But God, do a work in their heart today. And Lord, show them that it's a daily relationship that's important. Daily time with you. For it's in the name of Jesus that we do humbly, humbly pray. Amen.